Hi, this is Jack Lifton, and this is Critical Materials Corner. And today we're going to have a discussion with, with an actual miner of the world's first critical metal. So let me, let me just quickly tell you what I mean. Tin was discovered as much as 5,000 years ago. And of course, copper had been discovered at the same time or earlier. Uh, that was the Stone Age. Shortly after that, uh, the archeologists tell us we entered into the uh, Bronze Age. Now, what is bronze? Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. And guess what? Resource wars were fought many, many times in the ancient world over sources of tin. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say this to my British friends, but the only reason Rome had any interest or even knew about uh, ancient Britain was because of the tin from Cornwall, which they needed to make the bronze with which they could kill the people in Cornwall to take their tin. That was then. Now, tin is again a critical metal, and it, it's one of the most unknown metals to the average person in the world because it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere, so you 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 don't notice it. It's it's it, and this is uh, it's to me it's amazing. But in any case, I'm not the expert today. We have two of them. One is my colleague, Christopher Eccleston, the principal of Hallgarten and Company, who is covering uh, this area. And he's going to speak today with the CEO of Alpha Min Resources, a company based in South Africa, which is one of the world's largest tin producers and has the, the richest tin deposits in the world. So Christopher, uh, I'm turning it over to you and please introduce your, our guest. Thank you very much, Jack. So well, I'm here today with uh, Jack, of course, and with Mark Smith, the CEO of uh, Alpha Min, which is uh, listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange or Toronto Venture Exchange, uh, despite the fact that it has a massive market cap now. Um, so it should actually be upgrading uh, maybe that could be our first question. Um, Marit, so have you thought about upgrading to a higher listing category in, um, in Toronto? Christopher, yes, we, we are looking at that. For us, um, certainly it is, it is very important um, for as many institutional retail investors to, to have access to our share. So we are considering that, Christopher. Having okay. said that, we are delighted to have seen such a significant increase in our shared trade liquidity over the last 18 months. You know, we, yeah. we went from around a million shares a month to between 30 and 40 million shares traded a month. So that for us is already a, a, a big positive. But to answer your question, we are considering an uplift. Now, you're also quoted in Joburg, are you not? Yes, we are quoted on the on the... Alt X exchange right. in Johannesburg with very limited liquidity. Really, our area of focus is, is Toronto. Okay, well, is there a reason why there's limited liquidity there? Uh, free float is an issue, Christopher. The size of the register in Johannesburg is is of an insignificant scale. So, so okay. that is really the issue. Not, not enough shares on the register in, in South Africa. Okay, cool. Um, uh, to talk about markets a bit more, um, you know, we're now probably a year into TIN's recovery because TIN, um, in the wake of the first, you know, whiff of the pandemic, um, plunged to something like 13,000 um, a tonne, did it not? Uh, it's now at uh, 32,000 a tonne, um, having rallied massively. Uh, you, it, hung around the bottom there for a few months, but then really started um, rebounding. And then probably in this year, um, or really from like December, um, it went almost vertically up. Um, so really great development. Um, and the highest levels of tin seen for um, ages and ages now. So the uh, question that intrigues me is um, why with such a um, stunning rally, um, uh, is no one else trying to move in on your territory and uh, develop tin mines? Because there have been a few sort of um, tin wannabes over the last 20 years, um, but you are really the first major to be created in the tin space 
since really like the 1970s. So, um, yeah, like 50 or 50 years or more, <laughs> 60. That's correct, um, Christopher. And really, it goes to how difficult it is to finance a Greenfields project to production, right? It is yeah. not easy. As we all know, your, your traditional major miners being Anglo-American, Rio Tinto, um, Billiton and the like, are not really in your, in your, your critical minerals like tin, right? So, so yeah. really these Greenfields developments come or, or, or occur from, from smaller balance sheets and require significant external capital and debt financing, right? And yeah. we've now seen a period of five to 10 years where tin has been hovering around $20,000 a ton, which is not necessarily a, a bad price for, for an ore body like Alfman, right? We are blessed with the highest grade ore body in the world. So our cost of production is, is very low. But for most projects out there, Christopher, grades of tin in the ground average around 1%, whereas we, we are sitting at 4%. And the bottom line is that you then need to scale up production um, and you really need a tin price well in excess of $20,000 a ton to justify economic returns to potential financiers of your project, right? And the world hasn't seen tin prices on a sustainable level above $20,000 for a number of years. Now that has culminated in a supply shortfall. And to be honest with you, Christopher, the world is going to have to see prices above $30,000 a ton for a couple of years before confidence grows in the sustainability of the price, right? Investors yeah. aren't going to invest because of what happened in the last six months. You know, they need yeah. to see this, this um, being sustained before you will finance these new greenfields projects. And even then, when you, when, when you do accumulate the, the necessary funding solution, if you do a world-class job, it will take you seven years to get to production on average 10 to 12 years, from feasibility to financing to building and to commissioning. So there's a major lag in, in new greenfield supply. So that pretty much means that you're it for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so, of course, you've got, already got BC up and running and you're getting these 4% grades. Um, you're looking a bit farther afield uh, in, the, but in the general region and your general mineralogical system you've got there for other, um, you know, other manifestations so that you can use your, your, your critical mass in the region there of, um, of the northeast of the DRC. Um, what are you finding so far? Uh, what do you think is the potential? Um, have there ever been tin mines of four percent? No, not that we're aware of, um, Christopher. Not that we're aware of. Now, you know, going back five, six years, when we drilled up our initial resource, which is now our current producing ore body, we only drilled down to four hundred meters, right? And that for us right. was enough to justify what we would like to call our starter mine, which yeah. is where we're producing from at the moment. And we're producing around 4% of the world's mine tin, which, which I think is quite substantial. And in fact, we're the second largest mine outside of Indonesia and, and China. So that all body, we know extends at depth, Christopher. You know, the, the last set of drill holes at 400 meters intersected 16 meters of tin at 22% grade, right? So, so we are very positive um, that our ore body extends well below where our initial drilling stopped. And we are focusing internal cash flows on a drilling campaign at depth to at least, in our opinion, double what we currently have, right? So that's so the what, current... What is your life of mine with the current resource? Currently on the original uh, life of mine schedule, it runs until 2028 on what okay. has been drilled back then. Right. right. So we will be drilling at depth and, and we are quite positive that we will at least double our, our life on the current ore body. Then what is very significant is that right next door, 700 meters to the south, is another deposit. And we've released to the market the results from just about 10,000 meters worth of diamond drilling. We mm -hmm. are finding very good grades. We are now into phase three of our drilling. And we are hopeful that by the end of this calendar year, we will announce a maiden resource 
for the next door deposit, which we will believe will translate into, into the second ore body. And hopefully in the not too distant future, we can ramp up production and start producing from the next door ore body down the line. Um, and then further down south within our current license area, um, over approximately 15 kilometers of, of, of ridge running north-south, we have a number of prospective targets and we'll also be, be drilling those targets um, starting towards the end of quarter three of this year. So, so Christopher, the long and the short is we're allocating significant internal cash flows towards our various drilling campaigns. We are very hopeful that we will be able to expand our life of mine into a multi-decade operation. And furthermore, we are very hopeful that we will possibly increase, possibly double our production in the medium term in, in, in supplying some of the shortfall in the, in the, current, in the current market. Um, coming back to uh, that, seven, that deposit you mentioned that's like 700 metres away from where you are currently, would that be a second mine? Or would you just um, extend the existing mine in that direction and get into that other ore body? So in, in terms of the next door deposit, it is separate to our current ore body. It appears to be dipping in the same direction as our current ore body, and it appears to be taking a similar shape. You know, tin follows structures, and, and there's a whole structure crossing this ridge within our current license, license area. And from the next door deposit, it, it does appear that these tin fluids followed the structures and it, and it is taking a shape not too dissimilar to our current ore body. So it will be a separate underground mine, um, Christopher, but we will be able to, 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 to draw from synergies in terms of our, our current on-surface processing facilities. Okay, well, coming back to the issue of critical metals, um, uh, tantalum, of course, is a critical metal. And in um, areas of Central Africa, uh, tantalum quite often appears with tin. Um, have you been finding this at your, um, your explorations or not? Well, what right. other metals do you have, have you been finding? Right. So, so we, we're finding predominantly tin, but associated with other base metals like, like um, zinc, copper, a um, little bit of arsenic and the like. So a little bit of lead and silver as well. So basic base metals associated primarily with, with tin. In, in very small quantities do we find other base metal traces, which we, which we successfully extract from our final concentrate through, through our processing. So this facility. is a bit like the tin mines of Tasmania, no? where they have base metals rather than um, specialty metals. In Correct. The Correct. Correct. Right. And now to go back again to the critical metals issue, you know, we've heard a lot of kerfuffle in the US, the EU, JobMec, et cetera, um, talking about, um, you know, what are critical metals. And tin's always on the list. But when it comes to actually doing something about tin, uh, you know, politicians in Washington and elsewhere um, get themselves all excited about rare earths and, and things that, frankly, are just not as important as tin and things that are as dominated by China as tin, because, of course, China has an enormous position in tin, not only as a miner, but as a processor. So um, wh why do you think the politicians are missing the woods for the trees here um, in not putting, making a bet on, on future tin uh, supplies and yet getting themselves all hot and bothered about... Um, uh, rare earths and, and other such things that, um, frankly, we could ultimately do without, but we cannot do without tin because of its role in soldiers and, and you know, basic things that you know, keep our world together. Um, rare earths, uh, you know, if the, the wind turbines didn't turn or the EVs didn't roll, um, we'd all still be here. But um, the tin is far more strategic dare I say it, than rare earths. So why aren't they focusing on that? Well, I suppose that's the billion dollar question, Christopher, and I wish I knew the answer to it. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe there's a belief that, that one can extract enough supply out of Indonesia and the like, and it's not just beholden on China, although China produces 50% of the world's refined tin. Um, I, I, I don't know, Christopher. 
I just have to raise one point, which I think is important. It is not like there is not enough tin underground in the world. There is enough tin um, to satisfy demand going forward, even in the midst of this techno technological revolution. The issue is that the world needs a sustained higher tin price as an incentive to extract these lower grade, higher cost. Grade, higher grade, higher, grade, higher cost. Um, particularly um, in, in particularly India. In India. India. Yeah, in so, 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 so maybe the so, answer lies in an incentive price, which will stimulate demand and fill the supply, or stimulate supply and fill the 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 current deficit. Um, but certainly, there's enough tin around, Christopher. It just needs a better price. Jack, what do you think? Why do you think the politicians the, ignored the issue? Well, um, I'm not. No, I I think that you've hit on something very important, which is the blinders that the politicians were. Uh, I I think the answer to your question about why they're not, you know, interested in tin is is sort of obvious. They they have no understanding of it. They have no understanding of how our world is constructed and what holds it together. And, and so they jump on whatever, it, it's a self-sustaining fantasy. The, 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 the journalists who don't have any idea what they're talking about explain to the politicians what, what is important to those people who live on the Upper East Side of New York or in the gated communities in Washington, and they all decide that, well, I guess rare earths are important, whatever that is, and uh, cobalt, uh, and whatever that is, and lithium, well, I, have, I have a girlfriend who takes lithium, so they all know about that. You know, it, it's really a joke. Uh, I was, the question I'd like to ask Moritz is, what are the principal uses of tin today, and where are your markets by size? In terms of, in terms of the use of tin, primarily it is used in solder. And really, there was a step right. change in 2005 when lead was declared hazardous by first world economies, right? And tin had to replace yeah. lead in sold. And that's really where the step change in demand started. But interestingly enough, China still uses um, lead in 70% of their, their solders. So that's another area where, where, where demand will increase going forward as they continue with the, with the um, process of switching to to tin. So mainly used in solder, and solder is critical. It is the glue that holds the electronics and technology world together. Without yeah. solder, there's no circuit boards. Yeah, there's there's a line for the front page of your PowerPoint. It is absolutely absolutely critical. And 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 it's not really seen, right? So you know the use of solder is unseen. It's within your electronic devices. You can't really feel it. You can't really smell it. You know, and and that's maybe why it's not not um, hitting the radar to the extent that it should. Um, in terms of the electronics industry, as you well know, that is projected to grow by at least five percent annually going forward. Now, if you were to translate that into into growth in tin demand for solder in electronics, you know, then you're looking at another sixty thousand tons a year in five years' time, which incrementally is required fr from new supply, which is quite significant. Over ten years, you're looking at one hundred and fifty thousand tons, and um, so that's quite significant. Now. In terms of the, the markets for, for tin in solder, as you can imagine, predominantly in China, it being a world power in terms of manufacturing of, of electronic equipment. But also, Japan, South Korea, Europe, and the US are major, major users of, of tin in solder. Um, and, then, and then you need to, to, to think of the equation of these major first world economies uh, particularly Japan, South Korea, who are beholden on Indonesia and China for in, all intents and purposes um, um, in, in, in sourcing refined tin. So really a bit of an, an imbalance there. And it goes to your point as to maybe the world not recognizing the, the, the strategic importance of, of tin and, and supply being concentrated in Indonesia and China. Now, the, you, you me, mentioned the 32000 price at the moment and how it, um, for future development you need to really sort of like lock that in. Um, 
is there a mode um, for selling forward tin um, beyond the uh, the I, I'm not sure on the LME how how, many, how much you can sell forward in which you can lock in um, those prices and how uh, is the company disposed towards um, locking in the thirty two thousand in case it goes to thirty five um, or it goes to twenty seven or twenty even. Um, you know, because as we've seen, the problem in the past has been this um, sort of yo-yo um, in the price that uh, of the metal that has um, either encouraged or discouraged um, parties from entering the fray. Um, Christopher, you know, this question of, you know, to hedge or not to hedge is, is one that never has a, it will never have a right answer, right? Um, for us as a company, first of all, from a technical perspective, to answer your question, yes, you can forward sell tin on the LME market. Um, for a company of our size, we would probably be able to forward sell, you know, up to 40% of our production for, for f maybe 15 months or so, right? The issue with forward selling for us is that, first of all, you're selling into a backwardation curve. So the price reduces um, the further out you go in terms of fixing your price. But more importantly for us, we believe that we are not currently in a position where we need to protect the downside. Our margins are robust, our cash flows are robust, and our drilling campaigns are funded from current cash flows. Our debt is nearly repaid. We, we are hopeful that we will repay our debt this calendar year um, on the back of these prices. And so we have nothing to protect in our opinion at the moment. And really we would like to keep our business as fundamental as possible. And our business is about producing as much tin as possible and selling it when it's ready to be sold. Cool. Um, I have another question, and it comes back to the, the pricing again. Um, you know, for people who don't know, um, the tin price has had looming over it for decades and decades now, the total debacle of the early 1980s when the International uh, Tin Council the Tin Association or whatever it was back at the time, tried to create a corner in, in its own metal, um, sort of like the Bunker Huds um, uh, failed miserably in silver. But they tried to do uh, keep prices up rather than create a corner, um, and it all ended in, in massive tears. Do you think that the current price surge is the final burying of the debacle of the 1980s and that we can finally leave that behind and, uh, and say the tin is now <laughs> entirely subject to supply and demand, and thus people should be actually getting into it and doing um, more exploration. Because as you mentioned, um, the field has been largely left to junior juniors, and Alpha Min itself was a junior junior for um, quite a few years there. Um, there's it hovered between life and death, and now, you know, the patience has paid off, and... Um, what is your market cap now? At eight hundred million plus in Canada. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Around nine and eight to nine hundred million Canadian. What's well, a hundred million between friends? Um, <laughs> but uh, that's absolutely brilliant because you look at the universe of Australian juniors in that space. They're they're all ten million, fifteen million, oh. two million market caps, um, right. and they obviously don't have the wherewithal to. Um, move their own projects forward if their projects are worth moving forward. Um, so have, have we finally left behind that ghost? I think and, so. And uh, now we've faced the sunny uplands of, uh, of, you know, actually you invest in tin and you make money back. I think it's very relevant that tin is now traded through the LME, right? I think that's very relevant. Um, so the LME is now a custodian. Of, of supply and demand in tin. I believe that there's a, a, a fairly liquid free market now in, in tin. Um, and, and on the back of that, you know, why not see it, you know, in the same fashion as, as copper? You know, you do have a custodian. Um, there's a free market. Liquidity has improved significantly through the LME warehouse. Um, so I really think, I don't, I don't see the days coming back um, that you referred to. And certainly for me, it is now a well-regulated liquid metal, which in my opinion is worth investing in. I agree. 
Uh, can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear All you. Right. We, ha we have to wrap up this fascinating discussion, uh, but I do want to make... You just started. <laughs> yes, that's right. I want to make two points. One, for those of us who speak American English, these gentlemen are speaking about solder. They call it solder for some reason. It's solder. an L in it. <laughs> yes. and solder, but solder is a word that may resonate with Americans. They, they've heard of it, okay? Everyone's seen somebody solder a, a plumbing pipe, okay? The, the point is this, very simply. The use of tin in solder is absolutely critical to our society because what you don't realize is that chips, electronics, things like that are switches. They're merely telling relays to pass large amounts or stop passing large amounts of electricity. For that to happen, you need copper wire. For copper wire to be connected to circuits, you need solder. And, and so it, you don't see it, but without it, you, you would, we would not have any of these electronic toys that we, we deem so critical to our society. Anyway, I wanna thank uh, both of you, and I'm hoping this will put tin on everybody's radar. By the way, radar wouldn't work without tin either. So <laughs> thank, thank you, you General. Thank you very much. Thank Good, you. thank you very much.